Hello and welcome to After Scientology Straight Up and Vertical, the weekly show where Tony Ortega and I get together to review the events of the last week in regards to his reporting on Scientology activities and my input on that. And this has been a very successful run of shows. We're very happy you guys are enjoying these subscribing to both of our outlets on this and hopefully sharing it around because I think we've got interesting things to say. Tony, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. Great to be here, man. Yeah. So another knock 'em sock 'em week, I guess, in the Masterson retrial, and that definitely is the main focus. But you also posted an article about some stalking. You wrote a, it was a write up from a, a person who had been hired or working for the Church of Scientology to do stalking and harassment. I found it fascinating. I found well, it I'm so fortunate, Chris, because one of the tough things about covering this trial is what the heck do I do on the weekend when there's no trial, right. especially a four day weekend? I got to fill four days. Well, Boy, am I lucky that this former Scientology private investigator reached out to me with all this amazing information that's been bothering her all these years. She can't, she wants to get it off her chest, what she did for the Church of Scientology. And what she wrote to me was so well done. I just said to her, I'd like to post this under your name uh, rather than me spend, you know, trying to write it as my own article. And she agreed. And, you know, look, there's an issue to that. And, and she admits that she signed some agreements, you know, 13, 12 years, you know, 13 years ago, not to say anything. But she's decided it's more important to get this information out. I know this story by Alana Warren sounded very familiar to some of my readers. And that's because it's almost identical to what we heard from a woman named Sierra Westerman five years ago. Right. They both went to the same private investigation program at a college in Castleberry, Florida, where a woman named Michelle Morton ran that PI program and that she then hooked them each up uh, for job interviews with Terry Roffler and Dwayne Powell. Dwayne Powell is kind of the Eugene Ingram of the, of the 2000s. You know, mm -hmm. Eugene Ingram is a great name for those of us that have been around a long time. <laughs> He was a former LAPD officer, a corrupt former LAPD officer who worked as Scientology's uh, Dirty Tricks PI for many years. Yep. But in more recent years, it's been this Dwayne Powell and his son Daniel. And they, you know, the, 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 the really odd thing is both of these women, Sierra Westerman and Alana Warren, not only both went to that college, were in that same program, both were hired by Dwayne Powell to follow Scientolo ex-Scientologists in Clearwater around that time. They both ended up in romantic relationships with the guy that they were working for. It, I, I mean, it was it was so mirror world. I was like, wait a minute, didn't I already read this story? Like it was it, the same blow by blow. It's all so similar. Sierra Westerman, also remember Sierra Westerman infiltrated anonymous protests in Florida at that time and filmed them. Uh -huh. She and Powell had a relationship, they had a child. Uh, Alana Warren, in her piece this weekend, wrote that around the same time, she had a relationship with Powell. He got her pregnant, but he, you know, asked her to have a, an abortion and paid for it. So uh, I mean, she gave us the date and everything. Just an amazing thing that she put together. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, to prove who she was and what she'd done, she sent me all this material with photos. She took of Mike Rinder and Christy Colbrand following them around. And, you know, it's incredible how much money Scientology pays for these operations. I mean, at that time, remember, 2009 is when the Truth Rundown came out mm -hmm. in the Tampa Bay Times. And Scientology was, you know, David Miscavige was furiously paying tons of money to keep an eye on all these exes. And he was just paranoid about what they might say next. And so... You know, they they rented houses near these exes. They followed them 24 hours a day. She said they put GPS trackers on their cars, which Dwayne Powell did to Ron Miscavige That's up in Wisconsin. Right. Yeah. He admitted to the police up there. So just another layer of information confirming things that, you know, Mike and Christy were being watched 24 hours a day. And I'm really grateful to Alana for coming forward. We've got some more material coming out on, on uh, follow-ups. I've got Mike's reaction coming out. So 
really interesting uh and, and i'm just look it's been 13 years but it's it's you know they're doing this kind of thing now to oh. to some of the same people that are under surveillance and you know miscavige is just so paranoid he's got to know what these people are doing all the time that's right and this is just the ones that we know about i mean we know who he has in the scopes that we hear about or hear media about or hear reports about but who else are they surveilling we don't even know about? I mean, are they following senators around? Are they, what kind of influence peddling are these guys trying to get involved in with this? It is, it's sort of this, this you know, the thing that, that always rings true, always holds true for Scientology is it's always worse than you think. Yeah. Right? And so no matter what you think, how bad it is, no, you got to know it's actually a lot worse. And need we remind everybody, this is tax-exempt dollars paying for all of this. All of it. I, I got asked earlier today, that we're recording Sunday, on my Q&A show, how much money goes to legal? I'm like, man, I wish I knew. Yeah. They're not transparent about this, but clearly millions and millions of dollars. Clearly. I mean, it, it's just obviously it's that much money. So it's really frightening what you can get away with with this stuff and how Scientology gets away with it. It, it just it, it, at one point it's mind boggling, and at the other you're like, nope, it, it's all within these things. They get they they're well grooved patterns of behavior these guys have, and they just keep following their same playbook, you know. I, and I remember they you know this was. Um... They they were being surreptitious, surpt but but Mike also knew he was being followed. I visited him in Clearwater around this time. It may have been mm -hmm. 2011, mm -hmm. but um, I went down there and he wanted me to meet Robert Allblad, who was the guy that was trying to you know come to market with the clean ice machine, and we arranged to meet at some outdoor cafe. And Mike said, okay, watch this. And he did a little double back in the parking lot. And these cars were screeching around in the park. There were multiple cars following us. And when we pulled up and got out of the car, he said, watch this, watch it. And they were zooming around by us, you know. And so he knew this was going on all the time. But you can see from Atlanta's, I mean, I saw that with my own eyes. But you could see with Atlanta's report, they were, do they were also doing their both best to watch Amy Scobie and Matt Pesh, Hayden and Lucy James, um, surreptitiously through, you know, holes in the forest, she said, that, so they could watch them come to their warehouse. And I have copies of their reports, Chris. I can, sh you know, you can see minute by minute they are writing, who's arriving, who's leaving. So, you know, they don't, they don't know what's being said in these conversations. They don't, you know, but they, they're at least keeping track of, everybody coming and going from the house and right. i guess david miscavige wants that kind of information oh very much so i mean just to, just for some inside baseball on this i mean they have software that tracks connections it's all about connections hubbard wrote specific intelligence directives policies on this and it, and it's all about tracing down where is this coming from who's the source and by tracing all the connections they literally have this software that they'll it looks like that you know the standard conspiracy theory bulletin board with all the thread everywhere drawing all those connections that was stuff that was happening uh that incom their computer guys were creating when i was leaving that was 10 years ago Oh wow! So this is the so I saw this in play, right? And they use this in their data files as well for management of the organizations. And so this is how they think, and and getting all that information and and who's important and who's that guy and what's that and where are they going and you know it's all about trying to find those hidden suppressive people at the bottom of all of this. Well, it played out in an interesting way in the trial uh, this week. If we want to get back to yeah. the Danny Masterson retrial, yeah. um, there was an interesting moment a couple of times this past week when the issue of Scientologists and the audience became an issue mm -hmm. or, or, or agents for Scientology. And one was that uh, Vicki Podbreski had been in the courtroom the Friday before. I, I reported that I saw her there. She told a colleague of mine, oh, I was in the building. I thought I'd come by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, and I've pointed out, look, it's not 
surprising that Scientology would want a legal presence in the courtroom just to watch because these women are not just, you know, alleging crimes against Danny, uh, Danny Masterson in this trial. They're also suing Danny and the Church of Scientology for harassing them. So it's understandable why Scientology would want a presence. But usually Vicki uh, Pobreski, a longtime Scientology attorney, attorney, will send people down in her place. But this day she came. And then on Monday, uh, the DA raised the issue that when Vicki Pobreski was in the audience, Jane Doe One, who was on the witness stand, perceived that she had reacted to something she said by flipping her hair and making this face. And she felt that it had intimidated her and affected her testimony. So they wanted to say something so that the jury knew that that had happened. Defense attorney Philip Cohen was totally against it. He doesn't like, the, he didn't like the idea of, the, of a Scientology attorney in the courtroom being raised with the jury, but Judge Omedo allowed it. And so the, the DA asked Jane Doe One about that in official testimony. And she described the hair flip and that she just felt, you know, it, it she said it, it had, you know, disrupted her. And they just wanted the jury to know if, if it looked like Jane Doe One looked like she was faltering, it may have been that. Mm -hmm. So we moved on from that. Um, and later in the week, we didn't see Vicki Pabreski the rest of the week at all, that whole week. Mm -hmm. But on on Thursday, Jane Doe Two was now up at this up on the stand. And she was, you know, her testimony is so brutal. Oh. It's, it's, it's just, you know, and yes. she's very, she's a very thoughtful, intellectual person. And it's just, you know, as she describes this brutal attack, when he, she said he was like a jackhammer and she was like a rag doll. It's just so hard to hear. But she at one point stopped her testimony and said that a couple of people in the audience were bothering her. And given what had happened earlier in the week, you can't blame Judge Omedo for saying, okay, we need to check this out. Well, there were two women in the back of the audience, really, really pretty close to me. They both had on, they both looked somewhat similar. They both had on similar black coats and they both had their hair pulled back in buns in a similar way. And apparently Jane Doe too got the apparent, the, the sense with them looking so much alike that they were in some kind of uniform and maybe yeah. they were seal. They maybe they were sea org. Right. I don't. I don't. I couldn't tell you whether they look like seal or not. But I can see how they did look like they were, you know, together. And so they checked it out, and it turns out they were actually attorneys with the public defender's office. Mm -hmm. So this was just a mistake by Jane Doe too. But you know, I understand why the judge would want to check that out and see if it, you know see what it was. So the defense then jumped on that in cross-examination to kind of make it look like, oh, you know, these, these people see Scientologists everywhere. However, I will point out that right when that was going on, another reporter, my colleague, made a colleague of Pabreski, Vicky Pabreski, in the audience. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, and hey, look, she was sitting there being quiet. I'm not saying she was trying to intimidate anybody or anything. But, you know, it was, she had, she asked her specifically about it and she wouldn't say who she was with, but we we looked her up on the website and definitely she was one of Vicky Paparescu's creatures. And so it is interesting. It's like it, kind of a contrast there. Yes, a mistaken identity. These were not Scientologists. On the other hand, Scientology did have an attorney there very quietly. So, exactly. you know, it's, Judge Olmedo had a great analogy and she said, look, if you're a Dodger fan and you go to Dodger Stadium and half the audience are in Giants gear, you're going to be really unhappy, but you cannot get those Giants fans kicked out. And I thought that was a very similar to something I had said on a video earlier this week where I said, I know this isn't going to be a popular opinion, but Scientologists do have the right to come to court, sit in the audience, be quiet, don't shake your head or anything, and this, they can stay. And, and even a member of the Stan League, there was a member of the Stan League who came to the audience this week. Um, they had the right to sit there and uh, and be quiet. And so I agree with Judge Olmedo that, yeah, you, you can't kick them out just because they're Scientologists and if they're not doing anything. And it's just something, look, the, the jury doesn't know who they are. And that's really, really what matters is what the jury perceives. So mm -hmm. it was a Megan Kunif great reporter who's just an amazing reporter at the courthouse there 
she wrote this week that she's never seen a trial with so much involvement from the audience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking the same thing this week with the back and forth on that. And I I think I said even in the first trial, you know, with Podboreski or, or these other Scientology attorneys that you got to know that it's not just, they're not just there for, for, they are definitely there because they're in their environment. It's a legal perspective, but they are absolutely there reporting to Miscavige. I mean, zero question whatsoever in my mind that that is their primary function for being there is so that he gets a detailed report at the end of the day, every day on what went down and what, from their perspective of what's important and how he wants to be reported to and who knows exactly precisely what he thinks is important in this or what operations they might be engaging in around all of this. I'm thinking data collection on the jury, things like that. You don't put anything above Scientology when it comes to this, which doesn't even necessarily have to involve, by the way. I mean, it, it seems like it could. Maybe it doesn't. It doesn't wouldn't even have to involve the defense team or Masterson for the church to be engaged in its own operations on this, you know, because they are. That's kind of what OSA is about is intelligence gathering. They are, they really model themselves as and operate like a little intelligence operation. So if you think about it from that perspective, their actions take on an additional layer of kind of nefariousness, but it's all within the rights of what they get to do, which kind of sucks. But at the same time, if that wasn't that way, then, you know, we wouldn't be in there. So, ugh, you know, it's kind of nasty. Yeah. And I, I don't want, but I don't want the antics, uh, this sort of strange interaction in the audience is to overshadow is that two women gain incredible testimony. This yes, you know, exactly. Jane Doe, Jane Doe 1 described this brutal April 2003 attack. She went through days of cross-examination by Philip Cohen and held up to it very well. Jane Doe 2 came in and, like I said, she just gives the most brutal testimony. And she's so sympathetic and likable. And it's just really tough to see her go through that. And this is the third time, the third time these women exactly. have had to go through this, this testifying is under oath. Not to mention all the times they got interviewed by law enforcement and all that. That's right. So, you know, and the, the defense is doing what they can to chip away at small differences between things they said uh, before and now. I would say a big change is that, you know, these women went through this just in October and they've had since then to think about it. I bet... They've thought, yeah, you know, when he asked me this, I wish I'd said that. Mm -hmm. Because there were a couple times this week when we heard some real zingers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're w actually got to admit, very, very true. And I wanted to ask you also, because this was the week that Claire Headley gave expert witness testimony. And I was very curious, uh, very hopeful on that. Um, your reporting on it was fine, but I, and I watched your video from after the fact of that day where you talked about her and Sean Hawley going back and forth. Can you tell what was, what did you get of, you know, how she came across? How was the jury paying attention? Did they seem interested? Like, it, you know, how did that go? Yeah, I thought she did great. I mean, um, the, the fun, interesting thing was that Sean Hawley was still trying to get her kicked out up to the last minute. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Judge O'Brien was like, no, just look at my ruling. And so brought her in, and they had, and they also discussed where she was not going to go. They they the, Both the DA and the defense agreed. She's not going to talk about her own experiences. She's not going to she's not going to use the word escape. She can't say that she escaped Scientology. They really just wanted her to come in and talk about these terms that the Jane Doe's have been using. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, Jane Doe 1, Jane Doe 3, um, and Jane Doe 2 to a certain extent, they all got much more opportunity to talk about Scientology this time. And they got into nuts and bolts. Yeah. Really, really detailed stuff you've seen in my notes, Chris. And uh, at times, though, they would speak fast and use a lot of jargon. And it was confusing even for me. I remember there was one thing that uh, Jane Doe 1 had talked about. And Tori and I were comparing notes afterwards, and she was confused, and she had been in Scientology for so long. So, you know, what Blair was then really, what she was going to provide is she was going to go through and define some of these terms 
that the Jane Doe's had been doing. It was really helpful. So, you know, to talk about, you know, what's ethics protection, what's a knowledge report, what's a thing that shouldn't be report. And, and, and the main thing to confirm what these women were saying that when you come to Scientology talking about a crime committed against you by another Scientologist, they're going to put you through some bizarre ass ethics program. Yes. But number one, you cannot go to law enforcement. So Claire really, you know, confirmed what they were saying about that. And I thought a really, a really great moment was when, well, what happened? I think it was Deputy DA Anson that asked her, what happens when they're in conflict? What happens when your Scientology rules are in conflict with civil law? And she said a Scientologist will follow Scientology law over civil law every time. That's right. And I saw some people criticizing her that, wait, wait a minute, Scientologists don't use the word law. But see, that's what I liked about what she was doing. She was using non-Scientology general terms to help people understand Scientology concepts. Exactly. That's why she did such a good job. And um, what I mean, did, did you think she did a good job? defining those things chris i did i thought she actually did a great job defining those things because it is all about translating it into english and that's the that's the trick right some people are are better at that than others and so um and that's been my thing for 10 years is trying to translate this stuff and um and it's hard some some concepts are very hard to get across and she really clearly had thought through okay how am i going to describe this versus this even the uh the things that shouldn't be report versus the knowledge report she nailed it that's exactly the difference and that was so well defined the way yeah. she defined that was so good it helped me understand some things i didn't know before yeah and and then she was cross-examined by sean hawley and I just got the feeling Sean Hawley could not have been very thrilled to sort of be like, she's in a position to sort of defend the Church of Scientology. And I'm not sure she really wants to be there. So her, her cross was kind of funny because she had, when, when she was objecting, before Claire came up, when she was objecting was basically that, you know, Claire's not an academic. Yeah. And, and that her only qualification is that she was in it for so long. Yeah. And Judge Olmedo compared it to gangs. Yeah. That that sometimes being in a gang long enough makes you an expert on it. I thought that was great because Scientology would hate being compared to a, a criminal gang, even though they are one. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> and, and I liked it because, um, because gangs and domestic violence issues were part of the coercive control education, just like cults were. It's all the same dynamics. Which is why, you know, when you have been subjected to it for, you know, decades of your life, especially as a second gen, but not necessarily just as that, um, you really can bring some expertise, some explanations. And the things that she was asked about were 100% in the line about what we're talking about. Like an ex-member, would you, you would need somebody who was in that headspace to really translate these terms effectively. And that's exactly what they used her for. So two thumbs up, you know, and we don't have to get into evaluations of of uh, religious and human rights and all that other stuff. We're just translating the, the language, you know. And then I thought the funniest thing about, so Sean Hawley then, first thing she's going to do is try to question those qualifications. And so she said, so on the grade chart, OT goes to OT 15, right? But you're only an OT 4, right? You know, yeah, and yeah, I just exactly. thought that was so hilarious. Like Sean Hawley knows what OT is at all, you know. Oh yeah. And and, and then you know, Claire explained, look, my experience is in management, not in counseling. You know, I mean, and that's the thing about people in the Sea Org often have tons of experience of running the place, but they don't necessarily have time to do auditing. So they aren't they aren't necessarily that high on the bridge. That's so right. I mean, you and I know that, but it, but it, I guess it's just the jury. She's thinking that she's asking the jury, yeah, if there's OT 15s walking around out there, how come we only got an OT four? You know, so, <laughs> so ridiculous. Yeah, and for exactly. Those, and for those never, if those people are never in that aren't done or where they only have OT eight right now. They've never released OT nine and ten, and that OT fifteen on the grade chart is just theoretical. But uh, anyway, 
So funny, funny how even Masterson or somebody on their own side didn't prep her a little better for that kind of thing. To be honest, I'm a little bit thinking about that now. Going, hey, it's just it's just the impression you give the jury. They don't care what we think, you know. Yeah, and, no, and, true. So, and then true. they were questioning her neutrality and all that, and whether That's she was right. already headed in for one side or the other. I I thought she held up well. I mean, again, the, if the jury considers anything from Claire, it's just as a, a helpful guide to what some of these terms are that these women have been using yeah and uh hopefully they, they take that in and that's that's really all we can hope for yeah exactly and I, and and like we talked about last week sequentially it really did make sense for her to come in at this point clarify that testimony so that it was still fresh in the jurors minds i thought that was i, I thought that was well positioned that was interesting that they had her come in bet between, I mean, after the first two women and before the third. I mean, Jane Doe, too, who's on the stand now, uh, admittedly, she doesn't have as extensive a Scientology background as the other two. But, yeah. you know, on Thursday, she was talking about, you know, she had been through the whole ethics thing. She knew what Scientology would do to her if she turned in Masterson. She was well indoctrinated into Scientology policies. I mean, she she definitely was presenting the same set of ideas as the previous two women and now it was after claire so you know it was that like you, know, you said that's still fresh in their jury's mind so that worked out really well i thought yeah but it was sad timing that you know she she went like i said jane doe two's testimony is among the most brutal and she's really good at describing it she's a thoughtful person she really considers her words and then uh she began they began cross-examination of her and cohen went to all the usual things with her which is you know mainly what she was thinking when she went there that night why'd she stay so long and that kind of thing and um we had to break for a four-day weekend so that poor woman has got four days to think about coming back on tuesday and resuming cross-examination with philip cohen mm. it's just brutal That's man gotta be brutal these yeah. things are just there yeah and what he has to say i mean obviously the nature of the whole trial it's it's ugly ugly stuff I am um, happy. I guess I'm, I'm. I'm. You know. I'm. I'm glad that it's there now in such more volume. The clear-cut explanations that these women are allowed to give in their testimony now—they're not being chopped off with objection after objection and, and nonsense every time the word Scientology comes up. And so these yeah. concepts are really getting across a lot clearer. Because in the first time around, there was so clipped, so cut off. I was like, God damn it, I wish we had somebody just to testify about the Scientology stuff just because the jury's not getting this at all. And now it's so much clearer, so much more laid out and, and integrated between their testimony and Claire's that it's clear cut. There's no mistaking the idea that these were Scientologists who were told by Scientology, you cannot go to the authorities. You cannot call it this. I mean, it's very clear. And I really am glad that that is so much more prominently there because it says everything about their actions and why and then, took And forever. then real vivid things like Jane Doe 3 having to get Danny's car washed yes. to, make, to make amends to him. Yes, the amends. Because stuff. she had turned him in as a rapist. That's right. That's right. It's just backwards world. You're just get you can't understand this, you know, at yeah. all. It makes no sense. And they've and they've alluded to the thing about the earners, which is really good. I don't know that it's in there as well as I as I wish it could be, but it's you know, it's kind of in there that it's no, no, Danny's the app stat, he's the one who has to be supported, you know. Ugh. It was a short week, but a really eventful one. And um you know, I'm just, uh, so let me give you a little preview. So Tuesday, yeah. what are we looking at? Jane, Jane Doe 2 will, will continue her cross-examination on Tuesday. I would imagine they get it done on Tuesday. Um, Ju Judge Olmedo is being real restrictive on redirect and recross. Um, and so that keeps it really short. After, now see, Jane Doe 3 had one corroborating witness, her husband, Cedric. Mm -hmm. Jane Doe 1 had one corroborating witness, her cousin, Rachel, who was there in Florida and saw the bruises. And now Jane Doe 2, when she's done, has 
four corroborating witnesses. Wow. Uh, yeah, her mother, wow. That's the right. actress, the actress Jordan Ladd, uh, her friend um, Rachel S, and then also Mariah O'Brien, um, who is an interesting person because I don't think they're friends anymore. That's no. She said they weren't. So those four. After that, I assume we're going to get into the LAPD, and that means we're going to have Schlegel, Myers, Reyes, and Vargas, and it's a slog. Yeah, so, Vargas will be interesting. Well, let's hope he's more interesting than last time. Remember, he didn't; he had to keep referring to his notes all the yeah, time. Yeah, oh, that's forever. right, that's right. And then, uh, nice. and then, but the other new person uh, left would be the L- LAPD toxicologist. Would be right. the the last. I don't know the order they're going to have, but though, that's it uh, as far as so the prosecution's nice. case. So the end is in sight. If we can, you know, get through, it'll be interesting to see how much we can get through in these four days. Um, the next week, there's going to be, um, uh, I, let's see, we finish. I think the next week is all five days, nine to four. So, so, it, so it could finish in that time if things go. Could, could get the could get the prosecution's case in by it through that week and then mm-hmm. you know last time the defense called no witnesses at all they, right. they've got five on their list including claire's stepdad but i have a feeling they may call nobody at all again yeah I'm and thinking, then we'll see mm-hmm. if we can get an actual verdict out of these jurors this time okay well fingers crossed i guess we'll see what happens in this new week uh, again, shorter week and then full week the week after. So, um, so as always, in ending off the show, we hope that you found this educational, informative, and entertaining. And, of course, please subscribe to Tony Ortega's Substack. You can see the uh, address of that has been on display here the whole show. And, of course, please, please sign up for free emails. There you go. TonyOrtega.substack.com. You'll get my reports from the court. I send out like four of them a day. You'll get them the second I send them out to your own inbox. You don't have to go to a website. So please sign up for free emails at TonyOrtega.substack.com. Excellent. And of course, subscribe to this channel if you are not already subscribed. And on that happy note, I will see you guys next week. Bye-bye.